So this t-shirt I got here. It's Tony Aloysius, group server. He was 18 years old. He died in 1973. Aloysius means fame and war. It's a German word. He was born May 19, 1955, and he died November 22, 1973, which is actually 10 years to the day of JFK's assassination. So, 10 years exactly to the day of JFK's assassination. Tony uh, Aloysius Scripps ever got into a car wreck. But, anyways, Aloysius is, means fame and war, and this is him as a young man holding a, holding a dog. To be continued, chapter 21, the fox, I'm a fox, the fox said. Come and play with me, proposed the little prince. I'm so unhappy. I cannot play with you, the fox said. I am not tamed. Ah, uh, please excuse me, said the little prince. But after some thought, he added, what does that mean, tame? You do not live here, said the fox. What is it that you are looking for? I am looking for men, said the little prince. What does that mean, tame? Men, said the fox, they have guns and they hunt. It's very disturbing. They also raise chickens. These are their only interest. Are you looking for chickens? No, said the little prince. I am looking for friends. What does that mean, tame? It is an act too often neglected, said the fox. It means to establish ties. To establish ties? Just that, said the fox. To me, you are still nothing more than a little boy who is just like a hundred thousand other little boys. And I have no need of you. And you, on your part, have no need of me. To you, I am nothing more than a fox like a hundred thousand other foxes. But if you tame me, then we shall need each other. To me, you will be unique in all the world. To you, I shall be unique in all the world. I am beginning to understand, said the little prince. There is a flower. I think that she has tamed me. It is possible, said the, said the fox. On earth, one sees all sorts of things. Oh, but this is not on the earth, said the little prince. The fox seemed perplexed and very curious. On another planet? Yes. Are there hunters on that planet? No. Ah, oh, that is interesting. Are there chickens? No. Nothing is perfect, sighed the fox. But he came back to his idea. Here's a picture of, of what men look like. They hunt and have guns. So, nothing is perfect, sighed the fox. But he came back to his idea. My life is very monotonous, he said. I hunt chickens, and men hunt me. All the chickens are just alike, and all the men are just alike. And in consequence, I'm a little bored. But if you tame me, it would be as if the sun came to shine on my life. I shall know the sound of a step that would be different from all the others. Other steps send me hurrying back underneath the ground. Yours will call me like music out of my burrow. And then look, you see the grain fields down yonder? I do not eat bread. Wheat is of no use to me. The wheat fields have nothing to say to me, and that is sad. But you have hair that is the color of gold. Think how wonderful that will be when you have tamed me. The grain, which is also golden, will bring me back the thought of you. And I shall love to listen to the wind and the wheat. The fox gazed at the little prince for a long time. Please tame me, he said. I want to very much, the little prince replied, but I have not much time. I have friends to discover and a great many things to understand. One only understands the things that one tames, said the fox. Men have no more time to understand anything. They buy things already made at the shops. But there is no shop anywhere where one can buy friendship. And so men have no friends anymore. If you want a friend, tame me. What must I do to tame you? Asked the little prince. You must be very patient, replied the fox. First you will sit down at a little distance from me, like that, in the grass. I shall look at you out of the corner of my eye, and you will say nothing. Words are the source of misunderstandings but you will sit a little closer to me every day. The next day, the little prince came back. It would have been better to come back at the same hour, said the fox. If, for example, 
you come at four o'clock in the afternoon, then at three o'clock, for example, <laughs> it would have been better to come back at the same hour, said the fox. If, for example, you come at four o'clock in the afternoon, then at three o'clock, I shall begin to be happy. I shall feel happier and happier as the hour advances. At four o'clock, I shall already be worrying and jumping about. I shall show you how happy I am. But if you come at just any time, I shall never know at what hour my heart is to be ready to greet you. One must observe the proper rites. What's a right? asked the little prince. Those are the actions too often neglected, said the fox. They are what makes one day different from other days. One hour different from other hours. There is a right, for example, among my hunters. Every Thursday, they dance with the village girls. So Thursday is a wonderful day for me. I can take a walk as far as the vineyards. There's a picture of the fox. And there's burrow. If the hunters dance at just any time, every day would be just like every other day, and I should never have any vacation at all. So the little prince tamed the fox. And when the hour of his departure drew near, ah, said the fox, I shall cry. It is your own fault, said the little prince. I never wished you any sort of harm, but you wanted me to tame you. Yes, that is so, said the fox. But now you're going to cry, said the little prince. Yeah, that is so, said the fox. Then it has done you no good at all. It has done me good, said the fox, because of the color of the wheat fields. And then he added, go and look again at the roses. You will understand now that yours is unique in all the world. Then come back to say goodbye to me, and I will make you a present of a secret. The little prince went away to look again at the roses. You are not at all like my rose, he said, as yet you are nothing. No one has tamed you, and you have tamed no one. You are like my fox when I first knew him. He was only a fox like a hundred thousand other foxes. But I have made him my friend, and now he is, he is unique in all the world. And the roses were very much embarrassed. You are beautiful, but you are empty, he went on. One could not die for you. To be sure, an ordinary passerby would think that my rose looked just like you, the rose that belongs to me. But in herself alone, she is more important than all the hundreds of you other roses. Because it is she that I have watered. Because it is she that I have put under the glass globe. Because it is she that I have sheltered behind the screen. But because it is for her that I have killed the caterpillars. Except the two or three that we saved to become butterflies. Because it is she that I have listened to when she grumbled or boasted. Or sometimes when she said nothing. Because she is my rose. And he went back to meet the fox. Goodbye, he said. Goodbye, said the fox. And now here's my secret, a very simple secret. It is only with the heart that one sees rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. What is essential is invisible to the eye, the little prince repeated so that he would be sure to remember. It is only with the heart that one sees rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. It is the time you have wasted for your rose that makes your rose so important. It is the time I have wasted for my rose, said the little prince, so that he would be sure to remember. Men have forgotten this truth, said the fox, but you must not forget it. You become responsible forever for what you have tamed. You are responsible for your rose. I am responsible for my rose, the little prince repeated, so that he would be sure to remember. Good morning, said the little prince. Good morning, said the railroad switchman. What do you do here? The little prince asked. I sort out travelers in bundles of a thousand, said the switchman. I send off the trains that carry them, now to the right, now to the left. And a brilliantly lighted express train shook the switchman's cabin as it rushed by with a roar like thunder. They are in a great hurry, said the little prince. What are they looking for? Not even the locomotive engineer knows that, said the switchman. And then a second brilliantly lighted express thundered by in the opposite direction. Are they coming back already? demanded the little prince. These are not the same ones, said the switchman. It's an exchange. Were they not satisfied where they were, said the little prince, asked the little prince. No one is satisfied where he is, said the switchman. And they heard the rolling thunder of a third brilliantly lighted express. Are they pursuing the first travelers, demanded the little prince. They are pursuing nothing at all, said the switchman. They are asleep in there. If they are not asleep, then they are yawning. 
Only the children are flattening their noses against the window panes. Only the children know what they are looking for, said the little prince. They waste their time over a rag doll, and it becomes very important to them. And if anybody takes it away from them, they cry. They're lucky, said the switchman. 23. Good morning, said the little prince. Good morning, said the merchant. There was a merchant who sold pills that had been invented to quench thirst. You need only swallow one pill a week, and you would feel no need of anything to drink. Why are you selling those, asked the little prince. Because they save a tremendous amount of time, said the merchant. Computations have been made by experts. For these pills, you could save 53 minutes in every week. And what do I do with those 53 minutes? Anything you like. As for me, said the little prince to himself, if I had 53 minutes to spend as I liked, I should walk at my leisure toward a spring of fresh water. Twenty-four. It was now the eighth day since I had had my accident in the desert, and I had listened to the story of the merchant as I was drinking the last drop of my water supply. Ah, I said to the little prince, these memories of yours are very charming, but I have not yet succeeded in repairing my plane. I have nothing more to drink, and I too should be very happy if I could walk on my leisure toward a spring of fresh water. My friend the fox, the little prince said to me, my dear little man, this is no longer a matter that has anything to do with the fox. Why not? because I'm about to die of thirst. He did not follow my reasoning, and he answered me, It is a good thing to have had a friend, even if one is about to die. I, for instance, am very glad to have had a fox as a friend. He has no way of guessing the danger, I said to myself. He has never been either hungry or thirsty. A little sunshine is all he needs. But he looked at me steadily and replied to my thought, I am thirsty too. Let us look for a well. I made a gesture of weariness. It is absurd to look for a well at random in the immensity of the desert, but nevertheless we started walking. When we had trudged along for several hours, in silence the darkness fell and the stars began to come out. Thirst had made me a little feverish, and I looked at them as if I were in a dream. The little prince's last words came reeling back in my memory. Then you are thirsty too, I demanded, but he did not reply to my question. He merely said to me, water may also be good for the heart. I did not understand this answer, but I said nothing. I knew very well that it was impossible to cross-examine him. He was tired. He sat down. I sat beside him, and after a little silence, he spoke again. The stars are beautiful because of a flower that cannot be seen. I replied, yes, that is so. And without saying anything more, I looked across the ridges of sand that were stretched out before us in the moonlight. The desert is beautiful, the little prince added. And that was true. I've always loved the desert. One sits down on a desert sand dune, sees nothing, hears nothing. Yet, through the silence, something throbs and gleams. What makes the desert beautiful, said the little prince, is that somewhere it hides a well. I was astonished by a sudden understanding of that mysterious radiation of the sands. When I was a little boy, I lived in an old house. And legend told us that a treasure was buried there. To be sure, no one had ever known how to find it. Perhaps no one had ever even looked for it, but it was it cast an enchantment over that house. My home was hiding a secret in the depths of its heart. Yes, I said to the prince. The house, the stars, the desert, what gives them their beauty is something that is invisible. I am glad, he said, that you agree with my fox. As the little prince dropped off to sleep, I took him in my arms and set out walking once more. I felt deeply moved and stirred. It seemed to me that I was carrying a very fragile treasure. It seemed to me even that there is nothing more fragile on all the earth. In the moonlight, I looked at his pale forehead, his closed eyes, his locks of hair that trembled in the wind, and I said to myself, what I see here is nothing but a shell. What is most important is invisible. As his lips opened slightly with the suspicion of a half smile, I said to myself again, what moves me so deeply about this little prince who is sleeping here is his loyalty to a flower, the image of a rose that shines through his whole being like the flame of a lamp. And even when he is asleep, even when he is asleep, and I felt him to be more fragile still, I felt the need of protecting him as if he himself were a flame that might be extinguished by a little puff of wind. And as I walked on, I found the well at daybreak.